Hi, I'm Patty Parsons, co-host of That's My Story. I love this show, and often I'm always humbled by the people I get to meet. And, and today I'm humbled because I'm sitting here with Andrew Cougar, who has really just defied the odds and is on a journey that he didn't plan on, but life threw him a curveball and uh, set him on a new path. And Andrew Cougar is sitting here with me, and he's going to share a bit of his story. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Patty. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have you here. And I say that in, in all humility. One of the reasons I, I love doing this show is, you know, different people reach out to you, and you reached out on Facebook, not to me, because you wanted to get your story out there. And you started to share a little bit of your story on Facebook, and I thought, okay, this guy I want to meet. And then I think, you know, what is it? What was it about you that I want, oh, I want to meet? Um, and the thing that grasped me is you want to inspire people and motivate people. Yeah. Um, you know, I... I wasn't even something I wanted to pursue. I am a very introverted person. I enjoy doing things in the background. But as I shared my story and just my thoughts um, online and with my you know, inner circle, people would you know, comment how inspired they were. And I'd have random messages online from you know, people I didn't know telling me how I inspired them. And that felt very fulfilling. So I wanted to provide that value to others. And I figured, you know, why not turn this tragedy in my life to a positive? And so I decided, okay, this is something I want to pursue. Okay, because I don't know if people are going to notice, but you're not sitting in a chair, you're sitting in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, uh, unfortunately, had my accident from mountain biking, and uh, that left me as uh, a paraplegic. I had a long list of injuries, uh, I had multiple brain bleeds. Uh, I had a fracture C6, multiple fractures from T4 to T11, including a burst at T7, T8, which caused the spinal cord injury, 12 broken ribs, uh, bruised lungs, and a crushed esophagus. And uh, they didn't think I would survive the night or the surgery. Um, it was a 12 or 13 hour surgery, but I did survive. They kept me in a medically induced coma for a number of days and uh, woke me up and it, they told me that uh, I had the spinal cord injury and I would likely never walk again or recover uh, anything. At that time, T7, I was, I was paralyzed from the chest down. It strikes me that to wake up to that kind of news, I probably would have asked them to put me back to sleep. <laughs> I couldn't ask them anything because I had tubes coming out of all places in my body and couldn't so speak. you can't even talk. And honestly, it was just, uh, yeah, like I... Like, what is your brain doing? Well, it's because the last thing I remember is kicking off the ground to ride towards one of the last trails of the day. So your brain's just trying to process what happened, what's going on. And uh, I do... First waking up, the thought process, honestly, a lot of those memories aren't really there it's really kind of a bit foggy but I do remember two things that I was concerned about um and once I was able to actually kind of write right yeah I couldn't speak was I was really concerned am I going to be able to talk again uh <laughs> yeah, because like, that that well, worried that's me that's going to be not good yeah and then I was really concerned about is, is my grandmother okay God, that um, is so sweet that is so sweet yeah well like she's a huge part of my life from from day one we live together uh to this day and so uh, I wrote those questions that was not legible at all. But finally, once they were able to decode my bad writing, they, they were able to answer, yes, uh, I will be able to talk again one day. And yes, my grandmother is okay. Oh, my God. Was this during COVID? This was yeah, during COVID? Yeah, I was during COVID. Oh, my God. That's so, even worse. Yeah, yeah, well, like, I, luckily enough, my accident happened right when they kind of eased off their no visitor policy. Okay. So I was able to have one person visit the hospital uh, at a time while I was in there, at least. Was your grandmother one of the first people to see you? Uh, no, it was actually my uncle. Uh, okay. My uncle and uh, then my, my good friend who was with me during the ride, being, uh, uh, and also my business partner, Nathaniel. Okay. Those were the two people that uh, were able to come visit me. Oh, my God. You, you know, it's really interesting the way you were actually able to rhyme off your injuries. It's almost like they're... it's. 
when you say it, do you understand that it was you that it happened, or have you sort of disassociated? I think all there's the a words? level of dissociation. It's actually crazy because, like, I'll hear other stories in the spinal cord world, like of tragic accidents and stuff like that, and like my heart breaks. I'm like, oh, that's that's terrible. Horrible. It's it's gut wrenching. I'm like, like I kind of cringe thinking like that. That's terrible. And then I'm like, oh wait, wait that that's happened to me. <laughs> and, so there is a level of dissociation, and also just like I'm, I'm just so used to rhyming it off. But because point. you did, you just kind of blah, 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 blah. Yeah. For, the, for the rest of us, I'm kind of like, it's have, just what's yeah. a brain bleed? What does that mean? What is that? What, what is that? Like, what we? How many things do we have on our vertebrae? Like, I'm listening, going, I have no idea what he just said, but it doesn't sound good. No, it, it wasn't. I mean, it's. It's fascinating what the human body is capable of, and what the the human spirit and mind will push it through, um, because yeah, like you know, listing off a quarter of those injuries, someone should should be dead. Should be dead. Yeah, uh, I was thinking that. But, you know, that. Yeah, I'm not. And so it is pretty fascinating what the body and the mind will do to survive. But you're unique because not everybody would have been able to sustain because, you know, we did talk a lot. You were very physical. Let's talk about your life before. Yeah. Let's talk about, were you a physically active man before this Oh, all very. I, I actually would say the only reason I'm alive today is, and the surgeon was very upfront about this when we talked afterwards, is due to the muscle mass I had built from, uh, you know, being in the gym, being an athlete beforehand. So, yes, I was very athletic. Mountain biking was my bread and butter, obviously, during the summers. Uh, I did compete. Uh, that was the first year, actually, of competing. But even before that, I was heavily involved in mountain biking over the years. I casually played tennis with friends, but I also was into Brazilian jitsu, and I lifted weights religiously. So all sorts of things are part of everything you said has a discipline, has a mental discipline, a physical discipline, and it, not an emotional, but maybe, I don't know. But it seems you had a lot of disciplines put in place. Discipline is a huge part of it. Um, you know, in the gym, it's a huge thing. A lot of people... We'll say like, oh, I need the motivation. But motivation dies very quickly. Uh, you need discipline. And so, yeah, I, I credit my, my coach over the years for bodybuilding and, and, and the gym. He kind of taught me and instilled those lessons around discipline uh, in me. Because there are many days, you know, I didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to lift. But you, it's part of the program. Yeah, it's you part have of the program. To. Yeah. And so I built that discipline. And that discipline definitely was carried over. Uh, post accident. So, what hospital were you at? Uh, I got brought to Sunnybrook. Right. Um, spent a month at Sunnybrook. Okay. And then I went to the rehab hospital, which is Lindhurst, uh, which is only 10 minutes away from Sunnybrook. Okay. So, rehab now is a whole other world. Yeah. For you, right? Yeah. I mean, I was going to a clinic in Newmarket uh, for a private clinic for physiotherapy. Uh, activity-based physiotherapy and then after that uh, kind of started doing it on my own at home okay. and I'm back in the gym and that's kind of where I spend most of my time. So you go through something what was your emotional state? Afterwards it was dark very dark I was in a very dark place um, I mean I had this this thing happened to me that kind of just I, the way I describe it is you go throughout your life building this puzzle. You collect these little puzzle pieces, and you, throughout your life as you get older, you're putting these little puzzle pieces together, and they shape this image of who you are. Mm -hmm. And I had this accident that burst this puzzle into a million pieces and just destroyed this image of who I was. And so I was left with nothing. This puzzle is broken. I'm broken, and everything I, who I was to me at that time felt like was no longer a thing. So I felt like I lost everything. And so, yeah, it was a very dark place. I, I had no will. I was very angry that I survived, truthfully. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, well, I don't know. I can't even say what it would be like, but I think that there was a window. I might have. Uh, I remember being very angry in the hospital. My, my bed was beside the window. And I was so angry that I couldn't get up to jump out that window. And that's a bit ironic, because if I could get up to jump out that window, <laughs> would be not I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have cared to, to, or be angry about it. But um, yeah, it was, I was angry that I couldn't do that. Um, yeah, and, and you know, those, those thoughts 
they came and went, but yeah, they definitely, they definitely lingered. I'm wondering, did you have people that helped you through that anger? Did you, were, um, did they provide you with therapy as you're going through this thing? I, before even my accident happened, I had a, uh, a therapist okay. uh, that I saw. Uh, and so that, that assisted a bit, but truthfully, uh, yeah, I had, you know, some, some people that were these supports, but, uh, I would say therapy helped, which honestly, even like in those days I saw him once, but it, I didn't really start seeing him until a couple months after returning home, okay. but I was able to pull off some of our earlier sessions, uh, around like that. And I think that provided a lot of tools and emotional maturity to allow me to kind of process those thoughts. But then, you know, um, reading two different books, one called Can't Hurt Me and the other one called Man's Search for Meaning. Both that of those. That's Victor Frankl, I think. Yeah, yeah. And the other one, Can't Hurt Me by uh, David Goggins. David, yep. Both those books, I think, really helped me kind of build up the strength of my mind to kind of push through and, and kind of get through. So those were kind of the aids, I think, in, in kind of that. As you say that, can I, would you mind, you write poetry. Yeah. And I want to sort of understand through the words that you used, if you don't mind, what the darkness was like. Yeah, because for sure. Because you're sitting here now, and I think out of the darkness came light, so if you don't mind. Yeah, by, by okay. all means, it's All right, I'm just going to read that. I've got a minute. Goes. The physical pain they see worn as a jacket to cover the scars that they could not bear to see. For it is the emotional pain that leaves me in despair. They cut deeper than any surgeon's blade. What I would give to feel a thousand cuts from that very blade to release me of these thoughts and the pain I carry beneath my skin. Assumptions are made and it is the scars that are visible that draw the pity, but I assure you that I would give to break free of these chairs that hold me in the mental prison. These walls in my head are but my empty chamber for thoughts to echo endlessly. Worn as a mask, his smile shows itself, but easily shattered in the lonely hours as those through echo louder. Who knew that empty could weigh more than gold? What is a man worth when you take away everything and leave him with nothing to hold? No purpose, no desire, no will to push forth. The physical freedom to roam is of no worth if the chains around your mind grow stronger. The longer these chains remain, the faster thoughts of hope are flushed with a tsunami to be replaced with thoughts to depart and finally break free from these chains. I think you expressed darkness very well and we'll be right back on That's My Story with Andrew. Welcome back to That's My Story. And I just finished reading Andrew's poem. Thank you so much for letting me read it. It is emotional to, to hear somebody else describe a dark place. How does it feel for you now when you hear it being read? So for me, writing is an outlet. And as you can see in that, like, I don't follow any formats or rules. I just kind of put it out there, kind of, I guess, free verse style. And for me... I use writing to put all of my emotion in it. So I release that emotion. The emotion is attached to the words and it's there if I ever want to look back, reflect on it. But if I was to read it, there would be no emotion because I've already released that go. emotion. Yeah, yeah, that makes that. sense, yeah. And so, yeah, but I think, so it was nice to hear you read it because that's something I enjoy from my writing is getting, one, the feedback and stuff like that, but also to see the emotion come out for other people through it. Because, as I said, if I read it, the emotion's already gone. And you've also done the work. You've done the work. So where you were and where you are now, you are the sum of the work and the energy that you've been putting in to be healing yourself. Yeah. And I think, you know, to speak to that you had dreams before, right? Yes. So you, you are... You're still working. Yeah, I, mm. I worked in finance for eight years before the accident. So I obviously went on leave and had to, uh, uh, you know, take about a year and a half off, but I'm back in finance downtown on Bay Street. And let's explain this, because the word adaptive, adapting, adapt, comes up, it came often in our conversation. 
from what I see and what I understand, instead of making the world adapt to what you want, you've taken a completely different turn, which is I'm going to adapt myself yeah. to the world. You know, there's there's people that end up in this situation, and it's terrible, but um, who will sit back and kind of wait and will be angry that the world's not adapting them fast enough. I have my goals and ambitions in life, so I realize really quickly that the world is not going to adapt to me fast enough for me to be able to reach what I want. And I'm not going to waste my time or energy trying to force it to. I am going to put my energy in trying to build what I want out of life and adapting where I can. And so, yeah, I mean, my own house is a great example. Uh, my, my bedroom's upstairs, so I just try step dip up the stairs every night to go to bed. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but it sounds hard. Uh, yeah, you know, it it's sounds just... like I'm sort of pushing myself up on everything. Yeah, just bump I'll up each it. step. Yeah, I'll exactly. try it. I'll uh, let I, you know I don't recommend it. <laughs> don't think it. But to your point, because uh, I think I asked you if you had a lift, right? And you said no. No, no, no lift. Um, just tricep dip up there. I mean, it's a great arm workout, so. Yeah, and, you, and you're built to do that. And then I said, well, do you have wheelchair, and you went, no. So how do we get to work every day? Yeah, I just, I drive a little Toyota Corolla. So I just, uh, I hop into the driver's seat. I take apart my wheelchair, take the wheels off, take the cushion off, fold down the uh, backrest of the chair, throw it on the back seat, and I drive. Uh, the way the car works, I had to go through driver training to get my license back. Okay. Um, and it's hand controls. So you pull towards you for um, the accelerator and you push away for brake. Did, so was your brain able to assimilate that pretty quickly? It's weird. So for a while... Um, yeah, because I'm thinking your feet. Your, your, yeah, your initial reaction, because that's the way you're trained, is to you know use your foot. So yeah. my initial reaction is always like, got to hit the brake with the foot. So it took a while. Yeah. Uh, and even to this day, I, I give a little extra space. I will react. Like if there's an emergency, someone cuts me off, something like that. I, my brain has shifted to knowing this is the natural reaction to right. hit the brake with the hand. But I still give extra space just because I don't know if my brain might yeah. go for that. Because, like, my brain would fix and change really quick. Like, no, it's not the foot, it's the hand. Right. But that's about half a second. Yeah, but uh, is it going to be? And that, that makes a difference in an emergency situation where you need to slam the brakes. Because our brain, like, when I think about it, your brain is sending message, but your body is not responding to the message. Yeah, so there's a highway, right? Your spinal cord is the highway. And, you know, the nerves in my legs, they work fine. The nerves in my brain, they work fine. The site of injury in my spinal cord, however, has created a roadblock. And so the signals from my leg go up and hit that roadblock. The signals from my brain go down, hit the roadblock. So it's just that roadblock where they aren't meeting. And they gave you some pretty lousy prognosis. Yeah, they initially said, so, so T7, I was initially paralyzed, like, chest level, uh, yeah. mid-chest. No movement, no feeling, nothing below that. Um, and they said, you will likely never walk again. And truthfully, you'll probably not really recover anything than what you currently have. And you've defied those odds already. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like being told <laughs> what I can and cannot do. Uh, one of my principles throughout this has been do not allow others to define your future. And so I worked at it. So, you know, I definitely had struggles and, and down times uh, and setbacks, but I worked and worked and worked at it. I've recovered all my abdominal muscles. I've recovered uh, my back. And if you get me in a zero gravity environment, I can kind of get my right hip flexor engaged. Uh, and, you know, I'm not stopping. I don't know where that's going to end. But I'm not, I'm not going to stop uh, pursuing to see how far I can push my body and to recover as much as I possibly can while still pursuing this greater vision of what I want in my life. So when we talk about this greater vision of what you want for your life, let's share that. Yeah, I mean, I have a very comfortable career in finance. I'm very grateful for that, but I do want to shift out of it um, when the time is right by building, I have a uh, sport nutrition company on the side, which we have a big vision for that we want to grow. Uh, but then I also am trying to grow this kind of, you know, personal branding with public speaking, I have a book that I'm writing. 
uh, I will probably engage in some mindset coaching and, and stuff like that um, in the future with it. But yeah, so my vision is to grow my company because I'm very passionate about that and the things we want to do with that and as well as sharing my story and hopefully providing some inspiration and, and fulfillment for others as well. Have you met kids that have been in similar situations where they've had accidents, diving accidents or anything like that that have been left in a wheelchair? Have you met any kids that have been in your situation? I've not met uh, any kids uh, that have had a spinal cord injury. I've met a couple of kids that have things like MS, stuff like that, but uh, no, I do know of a few. One thing with kids that, as tragic as these accidents, I, I don't wish this on anybody. I hope it, you know, unfortunately it happens though. Yeah. And I, I guess just the way, you know, they're still growing, they are a little bit more loose. Kids tend to have a much higher recovery rate, uh, which I'm very thankful for. Um, and the thing is that I have witnessed from the kids that I know of because of online and stuff like that, there's something that we can learn from them because every kid that I've seen that has a spinal cord injury who has just had, from my perspective, from what my mindset was, was like, I just had everything ripped from me. They have so much more hope and, and happiness in them. And it's, it's a fascinating thing to watch and provides hope, but also there's so much we can learn off these kids. I think that's wonderful because as you're talking that you want to inspire, you've gone and garnered that hope and they've become an inspiration to you because I'm wondering when you meet with people, what is it that that you think and feel that you can inspire them with? Is it that you still have drive? Is it that you found hope? Like are the words that you think that will inspire people, what are some of the words that you have learned about you that I you would inspire somebody with? I actually got annoyed at first that people inspired by me because like I, I was so attached to like no I'm still me I'm still this nobody yeah. person whatever but I, I learned very quickly it's not my responsibility to dictate what someone's inspired by exactly and so if people are inspired by me then I want to make sure it's for the right reasons and it's for good I want to provide that that value and so I want to prove to myself but also to others that no matter what setbacks no matter what you face in life, you can still build a life by design. You can still live a life that is fulfilling and purpose-driven. And so I want people to look at me and see that, yeah, I, I did defy the odds, because that's been kind of my tagline throughout this whole thing. And so I'm trying to build this vision I have, you know, with the business and, and just what my life will be. And so I want people to be inspired by that and take that for whether it's recovering from a spinal cord injury right. or trying to build something that's fulfilling to them. Yeah, because I mean, it, all sorts of things happen in life to people, right? right. And so yours was this, um, and it was tragic, and yet you've taken this tragedy and through your process, through your mind, through your disciplines, through your being an athlete, you are turning this into the new life that you've had. And I think, again, it's adaptability. So mountain biking, will you mountain bike again? I'm already mountain biking again. Of course so, you are, yeah. of course you are. Yeah, I got, uh, thankfully, through a, an organization called High Fives Foundation. They sponsored me to uh, get an adaptive mountain bike. And so it's got two wheels in the front, one wheel in the back. I returned to the trails last year. And this year in the summer, I will, if things go well, likely be returning to racing. So. You had the accident mountain biking. You didn't have a memory, so your last memory was being mountain biking, but you don't have the memory of the accident. Was there any fear on that first? Yeah, I would like to say there wasn't, but and there honestly wasn't getting there. Uh, but I remember being on the top of my first line and looking down, and there was a bit of, you know, bit of fear. I could feel my heart drop a little, and. I did have to take a step back, uh, roll back, and uh, assess myself because I was very, my hand was uh, naturally wanting to grab the brake. So with mountain biking, one of the most dangerous things you can do is hit the brake. Um, oh, because it'll just throw you. That's yeah, rest. you you want a very comfortable relationship with the brakes, but it's a, a very communicative, 
healthy relationship. You do not want to slam the brakes. And so that fear kept trying to take over and make me hit the brakes. And so I realized this is dangerous. So I had to actually get out of the trails and spend a few weeks just riding like the gravel trails and around just to get comfortable just riding again. Yeah. And I was able to ride on the trails again. Uh, this year, uh, same thing. I'll probably ease myself back into it before uh, going back to the normal trails. But uh, yeah, there was definitely a fear component. But on that same note, once I got comfortable with it and dropped into the lines, all that fear was left at the top of the, on the line. Just, it just felt amazing being back where I felt like I belonged and feeling the wind in my face and being in the nature where I thought I'd never be again. It was just a, a beautiful thing. And, and just, uh, yeah, I felt home again. I think this is a beautiful way that we're going to wrap this up. If you had a few words just to really sum up where you are right now as a human being and how you see your future, what would they be? I, I would say that I'm not done. I'm moving forward. I have this big vision of what I want in my life and I'm moving towards that. And that applies to the principles that I've carried with me through this is you cannot allow anyone dictate your future and your tragedies do not define who you are. Well, I'm going to say your grandmother is very lucky to have you as a grandson. And I'm going to say thank you so very, very much for being on That's My Story. It really has been a pleasure. So thank you very much. No, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching That's My Story. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.